that we were supposed to have rain a couple of weeks ago, and then we and I, we were watching on radar, all right, and it split and come right around us. We didn't get a drop. I said, oh, you, I said, Lord, <laughs> you teasing me, Lord, you teasing me, Lord. Uh, anybody else, folks and folks that? Okay, let's go to God and pray. Father God above, it is so great that we can come together this evening as brothers and sisters and to be able to assemble together, to share our love with each other, to encourage each other, to have time of laughter, Father, and to show our love. And Father, I just thank you for this middle part of the week where that we can come and open your word and, and study another portion, Father. Thank you for Jonathan and for his willingness to let's try to teach this class to together and the studies that he and I have had together and what we both have learned over these last past weeks has just been phenomenal. And I I know that my knowledge of, of Paul's letter to Rome has grown. And I hope that our students, Father, those that have listened, that their knowledge as well has grown and has looked forward to these lessons as much as Jonathan and I look forward to teaching them. And Father, as always, as we are preparing, Father, help us to to even study even harder to where that we know that the that the that the things that we are teaching are accurate, Father, and accordance to your will and your way. And if we teach anything wrong, Father, I pray that you would defeat us. Father, thank you so much for this body of believers that meets here at Waters Road. Father, I pray your special blessing upon each and every one that's represented here. Father, thank you also for the generosity that they show you, Father, from the amount that they give, that we can take the monies that is contributed, Father, and to help spread your word, Father, to a lost and dying world. And Father, not only that, but the things that we try to do right here in our neighborhood, Father, I, I pray that you would bless each and every activity that we have to where that you will be glorified, Father, and your word of your precious son and his salvation will be will be known to all. Father, we know that you're the great physician. And we have seen you work in so many lives, Father, and we give you the praise for that. And thank you so much. But, Father, I pray that you would be mindful, Father, of those that we would like to lay at your feet tonight for special reasons, as well as for sickness, Father, as well as for comfort. Father, I pray that you'd continue to be with Hannah Gabbard as she is studying in the UK. Father, I pray that that you would put a hedge around her and keep her safe, Father. Open her eyes to what she will learn, Father. Clear her mind and open her mind to where that she may gather in the information that she needs and to enjoy this experience that she is undertaking. Father, I pray that you would be with Don Hovis and continue to to be with him. Father, for Rocky and for Sally Smith. Father, those that are having long-term illness, Father, and still recuperating, I pray for Cindy Burke, for Gary Clark and Al Hastings, Father, for what that we heard from Rebecca tonight, Father. I pray that that you would would you would intervene and that his blood pressure could come under control. Father, we pray for Rebecca herself and for Cookie Hawthorne. Continue to add your blessings upon Jerry and Pam Jones and Kristen Lively, Rick Ludwig and Charles and, and Peggy Flyer, Father, Connie Pope. Father, I pray for the whole Reinhardt family with what that they're going through. I pray for strength and I pray for discernment, Father. Pray for the Salinas family and for Lynn Smith. Father, I pray for Nancy Stover and family, and not only for Nancy, but for everyone that is dealing with the disease of cancer. Father, I pray that you would allow someone with the wisdom and the knowledge to come forward with a, with a cure for this disease that has touched most likely all of our lives. 
that we could eradicate it off the face of the earth. Father, I pray for Sam's boat. And Father, I raise up to you with thanksgiving, my wife, Edwina Thompson, and the good news that we got today. Father, I pray for uh, the Villarreal family, Father. And I pray that, that you would be with them with their safety as well as with their financial issues, Father. And always re remember Bob and Charlene York. Father, here we have prayed for rain for, seems like now for so long, and you have blessed the earth and blessed us, Father. And I thank you so much that you have shown grace to us, Father, and released the heavens and have supplied much needed rain to our area. Father, also pray that that you would be with the homebound members, Father, those that are so regular, Father, that visit with us online, but those that are dealing with difficult situations, Father, I pray that you would bless them as only you can. And I pray that you would be with Krista Morella, Father, as well with Bryce Stewart. Father, I pray that you would be with that situation. Now, Father, I know that there's others that are on our hearts and on our minds, and I pray that you be mindful of them as only you can be. Now, Father, I pray that you would forgive us of the sins that we've committed in our lives, Father, and bless us with love to forgive those who sinned against us. We ask you to lead us not into temptation, Father, for we're human and we're weak. And Father, I pray when you call us each one home, you grant for us a peaceful passing from this life. And Father, we ask all this in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. 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 Folks, if you will join me with silencing your your cell phone. Sure, everybody got alarmed about one uh, fifteen today. Yeah. <laughs> test. This is a test. What's that? One was silent. Uh, you can't silence that one. I knew about it when I was about it. You can't. That's the interesting part about this one. You can't, you can't silence it. The government made it so you can't silence theirs. Isn't that interesting? Well, uh, Cliff and I talked about it, and we decided to go ahead and skip to uh, Romans chapter 16. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just kidding. Y'all yeah. know us better than that. Y'all know us way better than that. No, we're continuing. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. If you've got your Bibles there, I would encourage you to open up your Bibles. Again, Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. We're going to look primarily tonight at Romans chapter 12, 14 and 15, but we're going to include 16 in our reading. Oh, okay. I was going to say. <laughs> we're not going to get there. Y'all been with us. This is the 132nd week that we have been in this study of Romans. And it's not that we're lazy. It's just that we're particular. Yeah. We, we decided wanted, to study that we got it right. Yeah. Know? We <laughs> want to make sure that we uh, speak where the scripture speaks and, and, and do justice to God's word. So if you have your Bible, let's read. I'm going to be reading from the new American standard, the 1995 update. Um, and I'll start in verse 14. And read through verse 16, then we're going to talk about it. Paul writes, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. And do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. I want to read that one more time. Um, Cliff and I were going through this uh, yesterday, and I said, there's a different wording for that verse 16 that I have often, I grew up, before I took Greek in college, I primarily just studied out of the King James Version and was accustomed to the way that was worded. And maybe you've read that a thousand times. Verse 16 says, but condescend to men of low estate. And I was like, Cliff, I know I've heard that somewhere before. <laughs> And then it dawned on me, wait, that's the King James. That's KJV. Yeah, that's the KJV, and that's what I grew up with. Um, but i never forget when I was a uh, sophomore uh, in Heritage Christian, I picked up a copy of the New American Standard because after you've taken Greek, 
and you learn to read literally Greek, and then you start trying to go back to some of the other translations, it can throw you off a little bit. And uh, New American Standard is, is as literal as it gets to the Greek. So that's the reason why we, we're using that from time to time. We, we do tend to quote the KJV and the New King James from time to time. ESV well. and yeah. NIV, it's like a tools in a toolbox. Right? All right. At that time. Um, as we approach a passage of scripture like the one that we've just read, you might think that the most challenging aspect of putting together a lesson like this would be Cliff and I coming together and studying and arriving at and agreeing upon uh, the correct interpretation. But quite honestly, with a number of commentaries that are out there that you can consult, and I don't know how many years have you been teaching, Cliff? Since I was mercy, I started teaching at age uh, 14, so I'm 67 now. Longer than I've been alive. Okay. <laughs> and for me, 20, 25, 30 years, somewhere around there. Um, it, it's not so much the interpretation that's the biggest challenge. Uh, the biggest challenge that Cliff and I see, especially in this study from Romans, is discerning the correct application of Paul's writings. In other words, how do these verses connect with our lives? What are the implications of these verses on our daily lives as Christians? That's really the, the biggest challenge that we faced up until this section. Yeah, and guys, really and truthfully, whenever you start to actually think about it, Paul's taught us nothing but sound doctrine. And what Jonathan and I have been trying to do is relay that sound doctrine that Paul has laid out all the way from the chapter one, all the way through uh, chapter 11. And then whenever we, we picked up with chapter 12 and we started with verse one and all the way through eight, Paul carried on that same sound doctrine that he's teaching to the wrong. Same thing as what Jonathan and I are still trying to relate. But folks, when you get to verse nine, I mean, it's, you're talking about a 180 boom. Paul does a full 180 at verse 9. And now what he does, he begins a rapid fire, kind of a, like a, a, a staccato type points. That's for musicians. That's for me and Charles that understands that. Yeah. I mean, forget, I, I, I said that right too, now, Charles. Yeah, no, okay, good. Okay. And I mean, it's it just one application after another. Bam, 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 bam. That he does, which is totally off of what he did all the way before from chapter one. And over the last three weeks, we've looked at what Jonathan and I have classified as the 13 aspects of love. 13 different aspects within the body of Christ. But then beginning with verse 14, as we're going to look at tonight, we'll now see something different. We know about the aspects. Now we're going to look at nine duties of love and some of the different contrasts that includes both us that are inside of the body of Christ and, and how that we are acting, our duties are to one another, as well as those that are outside of the body of Christ and our duties that we have as Christians to them. So that's where we're going to begin at it tonight as we look at verse 15. And following. Jonathan. All right, let's look at verse 14 again. Uh, we read that. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Here Paul is going to continue to detail what life in Christ on this side of eternity is supposed to look like. Followers of Jesus should be seen as those, quite frankly, who love each other and take care of each other mm -hmm. in powerful and very self-sacrificial ways. When somebody strikes at us, somebody strikes at you, what is your natural response class? That is our natural, what, what'd you say, duck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that one too. For everybody but Alan and me, 
because I grew up the smallest one, so it didn't do me very good to strike back. Uh, ducking was my best option. But for a lot of us, our natural response is that we're struck. We tend to want to strike back. And that can be that can be very much in word, right? Someone says something to you that hurts you. Your natural inclination is to fire back. Um, how difficult is it, class, to speak well of somebody who is harming us? Or is out to harm us? How hard is it to speak well of somebody like that? Very hard, yeah. I mean, we, we read in the New Testament that the toughest organ in our body to tame is what? So to keep our tongues in check and speak properly about someone else is a quite considerable accomplishment. And this teaching, as we've said about so much of the, the last 13 things, are so much easier in theory, but so much more difficult in practice. Yes. But it doesn't excuse us, right? We can't go, well, it's hard, so I'll just take a pass on this one, right? No. <laughs> no, we can't do that. Now, whenever you're studying this and you read this, we've already established that Paul was speaking to the Christians that were in Rome, both the Jewish Christians as well as the Gentile Christians, right? However, whenever you look at these passages, folks, Paul's also speaking to we who are the Christians in the Waters Road family. Because these passages and these teachings are just as applicable to us today as it was when Paul wrote to the Christians there in Rome. And it applies to how we interact with both believers as well with unbelievers. Now, Paul echoes the direct teaching of Jesus here. If you look over Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, he says, bless those who persecute you and don't curse them. Now, it's possible, it's possible, that you could say that Paul was referring to the persecution for the sake of Christ that was going on there in Rome and that would be going on there in Rome. However, when you look at it, folks, the same principle applies to any situation where we are the ones that are getting treated badly. Let's, let's take a survey for just a minute. How many of you watched Family Feud growing up? Anybody? You know what Family Feud is? It always have the thing that says, survey says, right? Well, let me do a quick survey. I'm just going to ask you to be honest with yourself and with each other here tonight. Do all of us always follow what Paul has just told us? We can be hurtful to each other in big ways and smaller ways, but as we've been studying, especially over the last few weeks, nothing communicates sincere love back to a brother or a sister in Christ who's being hurtful to us, then instead of repaying evil for evil, we refuse to do so and we refuse to strike back and instead we treat them in a loving manner. Nothing communicates sincere love, I think, in that situation more than your ability, instead of striking back, to respond in love. You know, the injunction here, however, in, in implies that not merely the restraint goes on here of the retaliation or even simple endurance of the persecution. But folks, you need a kind and a kindly disposition. Yeah. Someone read for us 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. Let's give you just a minute to grab that. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. Still talking about the same body. So if, if, you, if you remember, we talked about last week, everything was contained precisely within the body of Christ. But once you get to verse 14, Paul then opens up the box, so to speak. 
It's still about relationships inside the church, but it also has that caveat that sometimes these are relationships that extend beyond the body of Christ. Okay. Who has that first Peter two twenty four? us? Go ahead. It says, but how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. So Christians are to invoke God's blessing upon their persecutors. Look at Luke chapter 6, 27 and 28. Do you understand before you move on to that gospel, uh, also the same First uh, Peter book, there is a very powerful scripture that I think ties in really well, chapter 3, mm-hmm. and I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that, is that what you I mean. have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you will see your good behavior and give the credit to the Lord. So it, it kind of goes in hand. It does. And you know what's there in that verse that you can see jumping off the page is a consistency. And that consistency is so important. It is so important to be able to find that consistency to be able to respond with the right answer in the right tone and even in the right timing. Mm-hmm. Colin, will you get that Luke 6, uh, 27, 28? Do you have that? Of course. Luke 6, 27, 28. Read that for us if you don't mind. Seven. Yeah, Luke 6, uh, 27 and 28. Okay. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know how many times you've read that, but it, it still stings. Still stings, right? Because the command is, is quite life-altering if you truly follow it. Jonathan, I, I really think it's necessary to note that when Paul was saying that when Christians are persecuted, it basically implies that their enemy at that time, the way that they are treating them and they're treating them both unjustly as well as treating them maliciously. But folks, if you look at the term When it's persecution, now I didn't say persecuted, I said persecution. It's understood that believers basically did not provoke anything. I mean, the mistreatment that we're getting or being talked about here is is done for any wrongdoing. We didn't do anything that deserves this, but we're getting persecuted. And be a persecuting or a persecution for something that we didn't do or that we don't deserve. Rather, that is what happens again. Somebody reads First Peter chapter three, verse. It's a long reading, thirteen through seventeen. I want you to see this. First Peter chapter three, thirteen through seventeen. It is simply that as long as we're living in this world, folks. The enemies of Christ is going to be our enemies too. And we have to realize that. First Peter chapter 3, 13 through 17. Go ahead. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts will hear Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. 
And that finishes up what the Janice started. The point there. Go ahead, John. I think there's something that um, we should stress here that's pretty important. Whenever these times that we're mistreated come along, is there not a tendency when we feel mistreated that we begin to feel sort of like this resentment begin to bubble up in our hearts? Is that true? Yeah. And if this resentment is left to fester in our hearts, if it's left to its own devices, just sit there and stew, eventually what's going to happen is going to lead to us having a vindictive spirit. And we're going to look for that R word, that retaliation. That attitude cannot and must not be present among God's people. That's why Christ gave us the roadmap to handle such situations that arrived specifically within the body of Christ before it ever gets to that point. Um, I was speaking to somebody the other day, and we were talking about this very verse, Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. Christ said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him, private, alone. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen, take one, two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Again, we talked about this two weeks ago. This is still to be done in love. It's not to be done in a ha I gotcha attitude because that doesn't accomplish the will of God. And I, I cannot stress enough, and Cliff and I agree on this, that, that this is a very important principle. And I, I think that all of us in this room, if we analyze our lifetime, we've probably known of situations where we may have not been, uh, we may have been guilty of not following this, or maybe we've known others that have been guilty of not following this. And it could be uh, that we in turn allow a spoken word or an unkindly act uh, just to lie there and fester in our hearts. And sometimes when that fester gets poked and prodded, we just let loose. And whatever spews out of our mouth becomes very painful and very ugly, and it destroys relationships, and it can even destroy a whole congregation. It's bad enough. It can sow discord and, and disruption in a congregation point where it, it, it brings damage upon the, the local fellowship. Folks, Edwin and I have seen this literally play out in front of our own eyes. And it was it was absolutely awful to see. We attended a congregation one time we visited, and it was one of those old shotgun style churches that you see. You know, it had the middle aisle that walked down in two pew, you know, pews on both sides, and then you had the outside aisle coming back. Well, we kind of walked in, and as quick as we walked in, we felt the temperature kind of drop. No one said anything, and we walked on in, and we spoke to several people, and they kind of nodded back to us, and we walked on in, and we sat down. But I never will forget, at the closing prayer, whenever the last amen of the prayer was said, the two sides of the of the auditorium, they all stood up and not a single person went to the middle. They all walked to the side aisle, out the door of the auditorium on their side, out the church building on their side, and then got in their vehicles and they went home. It was almost like two different congregations meeting underneath one roof. Now, folks, let me ask you a question. How in the world can a congregation like that? Now, think about what I'm about to say. How can a congregation like that say that they are practicing sincere love? They can't. It's impossible. And this is what that we're talking about, a spoken word, an act. If it goes unattended, so to speak, 
And like Jonathan said, if it just sits there and festers and festers, and once it bubbles up, you can have a division like this inside of, of the Lord's own body. Or an unspoken word in that case, because they weren't talking to you. Yeah, and that's right, an unspoken word. Take your Bible to Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22 for me, please. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 22. I, I can imagine that, that pretty much everybody in this room has read this passage at some point in your life. It says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him. Inasmuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Now, look at that one more time. What does it say? Every kingdom divided against itself is what? It's going to be destroyed. It's going to crumble. Every city, every house divided against itself shall not stand. Folks, that also applies to our local congregations. Any church that is divided in the manner which Cliff described earlier, that church that they visited, that church is bound to eventually crumble. And if you look at what he follows this with, verse 26, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. If I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. In other words, church, class, Jesus never did anything that was contrary to the will of God. And in our relationships, a church that has resentment or hurt feelings or, or even a hurtful act that goes unresolved, it's a challenge for that church to display sincere love to each other, let alone if you can't love each other inside the church, how are you going to truly love the people outside? So right there, Jesus takes it from a natural progression, how the same thing works throughout. Kingdom, city, household, house. Divided against itself. That used the word curse. You had uh, Jesus speaking in, in Luke and Paul speaking in Romans 12. So now that natural progression of James uh, chapter 3, verse 9. With the yep. tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men. There you go. Who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So now you're all the way down from the kingdom to the individual. Yeah. And that used to work curse. Are y'all going to get in? Yeah, little? we are. Yeah, we are. We are. I promise you, we are. I love that verse 11. James 3 11, what you read. Does it fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? I, growing up in the town where I grew up, we had a, um, you ever seen like a, a place in a, where water just come, comes out of the ground constantly? Yeah. And I remember as a kid, we'd drive by that every day and I'd see that water running out of that spigot. And I'd always be like, boy, that's crazy. How does that water come from? <laughs> it was right down the street from the post office. So one day my mom went to the post office. I decided I'm going to get out of the car and go walk over there. And try some of that water. <laughs> you ever smell the rotten egg? <laughs> no. But if it's anything like this, I don't want none of it. Full of sulfur to the point, and quite literally, I'm not exaggerating, you could set that water on fire and it would burn. 
But it, it, that, that has always stuck with me because of that verse right there. Out of that opening, with the same opening, capable of putting out fresh, clean, pure water and bitter tasting water at the same time? Of course not. We know that doesn't make sense to us. Mm-hmm. But why we think it's right and normal for us to be that spring and out of our same uh, mouth come blessings and curses is is beyond me. Instead of the sincere love that we've been talking about, the normal human type of instinct, of course, is to do just the opposite. I mean, it is. We feel the natural desire to curse those who hurt us or to go one step further than that to even avoid doing good to any of them at all cost whenever that they do something bad to, to us. But as Johnson and I have said multiple times over this part of the, the, the study, this is such hard teachings. It's not something that is natural for us natural to do. It, it can only be done by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus and us being in there too. There's no other way that our human body and our human mindset can do that on our own without the Spirit living inside of us. You know, Jonathan, uh, there is another scripture that's ever beat us important compared to everything you're saying it goes in line in Colossians 4 and I find this scripture incredibly challenging as well because like you were saying earlier if we are all to our own brother and sister what can the outsider expect from us and I believe this one ties in really well verse 5 it says be wise in the way you act toward outsiders Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. That's very challenging. And, and let me let me put something out there to think about. When you're a brand new Christian, when you're a brand new convert to Christ, and I, I think back to when I was uh, a new Christian, did I come out of the waters just automatically? Was was I able to fulfill this automatically when I came out of those waters? Or is it possible that as a Christian grows and matures and the spirit lives in them and every day they are what? Renewed, their mind is renewed, transformed, that at some point it begins to become more of a change within you, that you're able to conduct yourself with more wisdom and discernment with the people that are outside the body of Christ and that your speech becomes more and more seasoned with grace. I mean, I I remember, I've said this story before, but I remember going on a band trip in high school and Noel Hicks and I, we grew up in the church together and we had these two other friends of mine, uh, Jim Odom and Jeremy Holderfield. And they went to the Baptist church and man, we got in that hotel room one night, four of us, and I mean, we just had us an old-fashioned Bible debate. And I look back on that, and the speech, it wasn't seasoned with grace. And did we accomplish anything that night? No. And I'm grateful that that Jim and, and Jeremy didn't give up on our friendship because Noel and I were the way we were, but we were new Christians still. We were still learning. And at some point, it begins to dawn on you that when you are conversing with people inside and outside the body of Christ, that your words have to be seasoned with the grace of which you, you've read that verse. By the way, let's let's not forget this. You know, you ask about the word curse, Alan. I think we should make a distinction here between uh, what is being said and what is not being said. Paul is is not speaking about, let's say somebody does you harm. Uh, He's not saying um, in this situation, this is when you just turn around and give somebody the business. Curse somebody out. Cuss somebody out, excuse me. There's a difference here in the word cuss and the word curse, okay? The word is curse, not cuss. Um, Paul is saying that we are not to curse them meaning that we are not to petition God 
to bring any harm or wrath upon that person just because they've harmed us. And I know that I've, I've heard people make comments about situations. Well, man, I sure hope God will, whatever. If you remember, didn't Jesus scold his own disciples for wanting to do the very same thing? Look in, in your Bible, Luke chapter 9, 51 through 55. <laughs> Luke chapter 9. Isn't it amazing? I mean, this comes, you've got the feeding of the 5,000, right? The transfiguration. Then you got the disciples arguing about who's the greatest, right? And then you look down at verse 51 and what's happening here. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John saw this, they asked what? Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Curse him. That's exactly what it did. Now, Folks, any Christian, and I'm talking about any Christian, who follows Paul's teaching here, there is no doubt in my mind that if you can do it the way that Paul is teaching and the Lord wants us to, that person is going to stand out no matter what culture that they go into, because they're going to be showing Christ likeness. Is that correct? They will also not only be imitating the words of Jesus. Well, folks, let's don't forget something. Jesus not only spoke the words, he carried the words out. He lived the words of himself and he gave it his own example. Because remember, what happened to him when he was hanging on the cross? What did he ask the father to do to those that were crucifying him? To forgive them. To forgive them. Now, folks, yeah, they don't know what they're doing. Now, folks, think about that for a minute and let that kind of melt inside of you what he did to those that were crucifying in him. Yeah, Stephen said the same thing when he's done. Yeah, Stephen said the same thing. You know, when you look um, closer textually to this verse, you can start to see that Paul is using a play on the double meaning of a word here. We talked about this last week. We looked at verse 13. Paul uses the Greek word dioko, which if you remember, this means to, to chase, to pursue. But then in verse 14, he uses a different form of the same Greek word, which means to persecute. Uh, diokonos, which means that you are one doing the chasing. You are the one persecuting. And in this case, you're talking about chasing somebody out of their normal social circles, whatever it may be, chasing them out of their normal circle of life, out of that into a, a way of going after them. Phil? You brought up Jesus on the cross and then he said, forgive them for what they do, that's what they do. It's interesting because it's very clear that in that situation, the Lord saw through the person to the Satan behind them that was influencing Satan's words were coming out of their mouth. Yes, they, they were emotional words from these people. Whenever he was persecuted, there were people who were acting through Satan's influence. The point being that when, when we tie this to the verses that we're talking about in Romans, if we can, with the Spirit's help, 
see a person who is persecuting us and recognize that they, in essence, don't know what they're doing. Because they're listening, they're being influenced, uh, quoted, if you will, through what Satan is doing. Look through the person and see the Satan. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what he does with Peter, right? When I think it's also what he had to do with Judas to exist with Judas, in the with yeah, the relationship yeah. he was with with Judas on a daily basis. He, he had to be able to do that. the true face was. Yeah. Great point. Anybody else? Is that still all that has to do with curse? I mean, we know it's not profound. Alan wants to get the curse. He really does. I, 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 well, I did. I just coincidentally have been doing a word study on this. What is there anything that we haven't brought out that you? Well, I just found? want to ask y'all. Right, we know that we're not talking about <laughs> profanity, okay? And we know that it does involve calling down the wrath of God in some circumstances. Well, I will say there there is a there is a two word phrase that I will not use. That would certainly be a not just a cuss but a curse, and and in that case, just be when they use that Greek word in here, can it not also involve just malicious, vindictive, accusatory speech? It has to, in some fashion, the way this word curse is translated, has to involve God in some fashion. That God is an acting agent in this particular element. That's what I was asking, not want to get into what I had looked at on here. Like it would be the difference between God bless and God curse. You, you know what I mean? I understand. You call it judgment now. Right. Yeah. Asking God to condemn them. Good point. Alan. Physically or physically or spiritually. Yeah. Or both. Or both. Alan, anything else? That's good. Move on. Move on. <laughs> so does the bless. So you know? the curse is supposed to be God cursing. The bless also is, or is it just you being a blessing to them by? I think it goes both ways. I think it goes both ways. I think, Carol, it is basically you blessing them with goodness, but also asking the Lord to show His grace. But again, any blessing that you would, any blessing that you would give them, you got to remember where it gets its power from, where it gets its strength from. Is there two? Is there two Greek words for those for those words? For bless and curse, absolutely different. No, for bless. Oh, for bless? If we bless or if God. No, bless, then not in this no, case. No. Not in this case. Because, Charles, if, if we look, since, since, since we're looking at this, you know, kind of textorally, and if you look more closely, the verb here, it's interesting that the word bless is a verb here. There's a noun form and there's verb a verb form. This is, this is the verb form. And it comes from a Greek compound word. <laughs> Eulogios. Now, it primarily means to speak well of someone. Which, by the way, if you if you hear that, you know what that we have a word that we use. You and I have used many times since I've been here at Waters Road that comes from that. Maybe eulogy. Eulogy. Just yeah. that's well of. We get that. And we can bless God. Yeah, we get our word eulogy from this same thing. From, from 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 this is where they, it, it, it comes from. Now, whenever someone speaks at a funeral, I've heard you and I've heard Jonathan. I've even done it whenever that 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 I've done it at a funeral. What's the purpose of a eulogy, folks? To remember something good about. To remember something good about somebody. To maybe speak about their accomplishments. Maybe to speak about a tribute. To that individual and what that individual has done in their lives, well, that's blessing to give that blessing. Um, how hard is it, class, to pay a tribute to somebody who has done you wrong? Let's say that, that you are a child. And I, I, I hate to go here because I know it could be personal for somebody, but think about it. If your child and your mother or father has been enormously abusive to you and then they die, how hard would it be to get up in front of a crowd and speak well of that mother or father? It would be extremely hard, right? 
Give the eulogy. Yeah, give the eulogy. Wow. It, it would be very tough. But in terms of our relationships in, in the church and those in the outside world, it, it's still hard, extremely hard sometimes to pay tribute, to speak well, or even ask the Lord to be graceful upon somebody who has done us wrong. And obeying commandments like this, as Cliff said, is so unnatural to our own nature that the power has to come from somewhere other than just us going, well, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps here and I'm going to speak well of them. You know, that sounds good in theory, but we're going to fail. It, there has to be a strength that comes from something more. And I think we've learned what that strength is. And I don't want to sugarcoat this at all, but if you're a Christian and you're living a godly life, listen, that if you're striving to live a godly life, eventually you're going to face persecution. It's the same words that Paul spoke to young Timothy. Second Timothy chapter three and verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, what? will be persecuted, not may be persecuted, or there's a slim chance you may be. No, it says you will be persecuted. And even Christ reminded us that that whenever we are persecuted, it's not against us. Who is it ultimately against? Against Jesus. That's right. Well, we really wanted to get to 14 and 15. <laughs> but this verse has got so much in it. And as we're closing out, let me give you some more Bible verses that you can take home and possibly read and study more about this. Matthew 5, 44. And if you, if you want to write these down, I'm going to read them to you, but you can go home and you can, and you can study more. Matthew 5, 44, whenever, that, whenever Jesus was given the sermon on the mount he said but i say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you now there again like jonathan and i have been saying this is not natural folks this is not human nature here this has got to be done by the power of the holy you spirit said, pray for your enemies not yourself that's right pray, pray for, for your enemies you know? yeah yeah First Peter chapter three and verse nine, do not repay evil for evil or reveling for rebel, uh, rivaling for rivaling, but on the contrary, bless or to do this, you are called that you may obtain a blessing. So if you want the Lord's blessing, then you have to do the blessing first and then the Lord will then bless you. Not only are we to bless them, but we're also to be sympathetic with those around us, folks. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. First Corinthians eleven twenty nine. Second Corinthians. Oh, I'm sorry, second Corinthians. Thank you, John. Eleven. 29, who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to fall? Am I not indignant? Jesus said in Matthew 5, we've, we've already looked at it, Matthew 5, 44 through 45. So folks, these teaching here is not something that we do naturally. And it's certainly not something that we've talked about it. This has been this has been a very hard verse to teach. All right, we've got about uh, three minutes. Uh, any questions? Any comments on anything we've talked here tonight? Please, because okay. Alan said he would answer them. Yeah, I was just thinking about something. That if, if you have things that happen to you in your life and They're um, harmful, whatever, and you, from time to time, bring them up as examples or things like that. Is, is it wrong? Or is it, I mean, if you're like saying, "Oh, well, this happened to me," or whatever, you know, just beginning 
I think it would depend on the spirit in which you would be speaking of them, right? Yeah. Like if you were using it to speak ill of whoever that person that harmed you and you're calling them out and making it their identity very well known, yeah. that could become an yeah, issue. Obviously. It could be it's, used. If it's it. just an essence that nobody knows, you know, it's not yeah. a, If you were just, just using it as a as a part of your witness, <laughs> you know, and part of what you've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. It could be used as an example in trying to encourage somebody that may have been going through something similar. Right. And by the way, this this reminds me of something. I want to say this before we close. Um, if you do something bad and you receive punishment for that which you've done bad, that's not persecution. Okay, so let's please understand. We're not talking about tonight a situation where you, you do something bad, you get caught and people, you know, you pay a penalty or there's a punishment that comes along. That's not what Paul's talking about here. You, you got to remember there's the caveat when you are persecuted for doing good. If we get to chapter 13, he's going to talk about the purpose of government, right? We're going to see that God has instituted laws and governments. The, the guilty should be punished. Yeah. That's what the whole thing's about. I always like to go to a man after God's own heart, kind of the thing that Bill's been on on Sunday mornings. We all want to have a heart after God's heart. And this is all about the heart. This is about the attitude and the mindset. Because King David killed a lot of people. Yeah. But he was a man after God's own heart. We're not supposed to lay down against that which is evil. We stand up against evil. But he's talking about one on one relationships. When you have an opportunity to convert that person by being Christ like, it makes perfect sense. Because you're acting unnatural and showing love where the guy's trying to show hate. But it doesn't mean lay down and let the evil person kill your children because you're going to turn the other cheek and let it happen. Yeah, I had a I had a uh, teacher uh, in Austin at a church in Austin that was teaching a class, and uh, he made this example. He said, "If you know, if a person comes into your house to rob you, uh, and he is going to take your life, and he asks you uh, if your children and your wife are upstairs, you better tell him the truth that your wife and children are upstairs. Otherwise, you're going to go to hell for lying. And, and if you tell them they're not upstairs, and and there's a certain verse in the Old Testament that's pretty clear that says, do not speak to a fool his folly. And in that situation, it's not that it's not a lie that's going to condemn your soul. You are not. This person is a fool. OK. And, and, and what they're doing is foolish. You do not speak to a fool in his folly. You don't give him the ammunition he needs in that folly. And the same goes with our, our government and other situations that are against what we're supposed to be doing. Um don't give them ammunition against that they can use against you at all possible. You know, Jonathan, what comes to mind is the situation with, with Rahab and the situation with Abraham. Right. They both lied in situations that got blessed for a purpose. So it is depending on the context. By the way, if you're wanting to know that verse, it's Proverbs 26, 5. That's, that's a verse that uh, stuck me four and five, really. All right. Any other questions? All right. Do we have any other prayer requests or anything that came in, uh, Wayne? Uh, yeah. Chad, would you ask that we pray for him and Kathy? Okay. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for this midweek and this time that We've been able to set aside to come together as your family here at Waters Road. And whether it be this class or or the other classes that are meeting tonight for, for all the various ages. Father, I pray that everything that we've done has ultimately been according to your will. And that is Cliff and I have taught these things tonight that they have been truly representative of your truth and your will for our lives, especially as we've talked about the relationships that we have one to another and 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 god we really want to treat each other the way that you would have us to do so and and not only inside but outside the body of christ and to our society and in our nation and as we've spoken about just a moment even our government father we always want to do everything that we can do to be in line with your will for for our lives and so father uh we pray that everything we've done here tonight is pleasing to you and and will help us to grow spiritually and, and more like your son, Jesus, in the way that we conduct our lives and the way that we love each other and the way that we treat each other, even in those moments where we've been harmed. 
Father, we thank you for this class, for every person who's represented here tonight. Pray, Father, that you, you would grant each person uh, safety as they make their way back to their homes. Father, for the rest of this week, I pray that we would be active in our service to you, that we would keep you fresh in our minds and the mission of discipling be fresh in, in our hearts and that we constantly be looking for the opportunities that you would put in front of us to share your truth with somebody else, whether it be in word or even, Father, the example that we set in front of others, whether at work or at school or or whatever uh, faculty of life that we're currently involved in, Father, just pray that we have that consistency that we've talked about, that we would know how to answer those who might question us about the faith that we have and the hope that we have, and that we can do so, Father, with that discernment and that spirit that will allow us to win them to you. We thank you for Jesus, for his forgiveness that is possible in our lives through the blood that he shed on that cross, that his resurrection gives us the hope of victory, that one day we too will be resurrected to a new uh, eternal life with you forevermore. We, we look forward to that day. We long for that day when Christ will return and bring us home to be with you for eternity. Father, for the judgment, we pray that we might all be, be ready, always ready, and that we always, Father, we trust in your plan. Father, forgive us of our failures, for our shortcomings, both of action and inaction, and help us to always be consistent in the way that we live our lives, both at home, at church, and, and in the other areas of life. So, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you.